Okay, good afternoon everyone. Uh, welcome to OGBB3. Um, this afternoon we have Tom Clark presenting What Should a System Administration Student's Homework Look Like? I haven't done anything yet. The, uh... Okay, so I think before I start, I should uh, I should take a second to kind of explain what I, I am fully aware is a long and ungainly title for a talk. Uh, but the reason is, the reason that I hope to convince you of is that if you want to teach this administration, this is the crux of the issue. This is the question you've got to answer. What are you going to assign the students to do? How are you going to assess the quality of their work? It turns out in teaching this administration, I think that's the tricky issue, and that's the, the issue I'll kind of talk about what I've done towards solving that problem towards answering that question today. But first, um, I was thinking, you know, observing different talks over the last few days, and I, I was musing on this and thought about, well, what are the, the attributes of a good conference presenter? And really, I think there are two. Um, and the first one is, of course, really strong expertise for, about the particular topic on which we're presenting. And fair enough, that makes sense. And the other one, the one that I hope is more important, is a, a real genuine enthusiasm for the topic, the sort of enthusiasm that a speaker can really convey and share with his or her audience. Um, and I think for the next few minutes, I can promise you at least a second of those two things because I am really enthusiastic about the idea of teaching system administration. I mean, I like system administration. I've been a systems administrator, but I really like teaching it. I think that it is something that is worthwhile. I think that it is challenging, um, and I think that it's fun. Um, and I, I hope to share some of that with you here. And almost that. I mean, I haven't been teaching this stuff for that long. I've mostly been working in industry in my career, and it's only a few years ago that I started teaching as my full-time job um, and started teaching system administration. So um, I think it's worthwhile to take a minute and think, well, how did I, how did I get here? Um, how did I come to be enthusiastic about teaching system administration? And as it turns out, that's a little bit of a funny story, or maybe an embarrassing one. We'll see. Um, and yeah, so it turns out I run my mouth a lot. And interesting challenges um, that may be happening right now. Um, it certainly happened, I can tell you, what, about three years ago or so, um, when I was interviewing for my current position at Otago Polytechnic. Because apparently, at some point during the interview, and now my memory of these events is somewhat hazy, but the interview panel insists that I said this, and we have to take them at their words, said that at some point during the interview, I said, you know what would be cool? Like an advanced Linux systems administration class. That's not the kind of thing you see very much. That would be a neat addition to the program. But I said this. I've got to own up to it. Um, so I got the job, as you can see. And I show up, so my first day on the new job, and what do we do? We have a department meeting, um, and the topic is what are the, the classes that we're going to offer in the next academic year and how we're going to organize it. And so at this meeting, where, you know, my very first few minutes on the job, my new colleagues come to me and they say, that thing you talked about in the interview, that advanced sysadmin class, we like that idea. We think that is cool. We'd like you to teach it um, first semester next year. And so I'm like, oh, I've kind of got myself into a good one there because that's going to be a tricky thing. Uh, but why is it such a tricky thing? I mean, presumably I'm reasonably well qualified you know, to be a lecturer. Teaching stuff is what I'm supposed to do. Why is this one so hard? Um, and so let's, let's talk for a few minutes about why it's so hard. Um, the real problem, first off, is that teaching system administration itself is pretty new. Um, it's not traditionally part of a CS curriculum. It's not traditionally CS, even though I, I would argue that it's very relevant. Um, but, um, but because it's new, we don't have a lot of examples. We can't really look at a lot of things and say, oh, that's an example of a good systems administration class. And it's worth it to take a second and contrast that with the situation in teaching programming. Because a programming situation is a lot different. If we say, let's set up a new programming class, um, that's relatively easy. We have plenty of good examples to work with. There's lots of course material out there available. Why? Well, for one thing, because, yeah, we've been teaching programming for a long time. And so, you yeah, know, we at least claim to know what we want to teach. We at least claim that we know, we say what we want to teach, like what are the big ideas? What are the, the really lasting themes or whatever that we want to convey? 
to our students. We can do that with programming, and we can at least claim that we have some idea about how to teach these topics. And certainly it's the case, I mean, the really nice thing about teaching programming, so let's say I'm going to teach you programming, what am I going to do? I'm going to have you write a computer program. And by the very nature of the you have produced an artifact that I can examine and evaluate its quality. I can look at your source code and see whether you've done a decent job. I can run your program and see whether it satisfies the requirements of the assignment, and I can assign you a mark based on that, and that's all great. But we don't really have an analog like that for assistant administrators' work. You don't produce quite so much of an artifact. I mean, we could say, oh, I'll look at the config file, and that's fine, um, but there's, if you think about there's something about the way config files are set up that it doesn't really um, doesn't really provide a good measure of the quality of a student's work looking at a config file in the way that looking at source code does. So that's one problem. But another problem is, again, um, I mean, sysadmins, they don't really write config files for a living. That's not really the task. The task is to successfully run systems in a way that makes them available and then perform adequately and that sort of thing. So it's not about producing a thing that we can look at later. It's about doing a thing. And then if I, as a lecturer, I want to assess your performance on it, I need to watch you do the thing and see how you do it in real time, if you will. So that, that's the big challenge we have to sort out. There are some other challenges there. So, um, yeah, I say there aren't a lot of examples to draw on. What examples there are um, in terms of, of classes and materials for teaching classes in, in systems administration, those things tend to be vendor-driven or certification program-driven. And I mean, those classes are fine up to a point. They have their place, and that's all right. But that's not really the thing I was looking for. Um, you know, in a particular, what you get in those classes, well, you get two issues. And one is it tends to be much more about how to accomplish a specific task, usually on a specific platform. And that's not really a lasting, valuable skill that we want to teach in school. That's not something worth paying a fee to be you know, taught how to do. That's not really the kind of thing that we're shooting for there. Um, and it, you know, in a way, the skills, uh, they're just a little bit too small, a little bit too narrow to really capture what systems administration is. The other problem is that, a lot of, of course, a lot of these certification-based classes, what you're really being trained how to do is how to pass the certification exam, which is not the same thing as, as administering systems. Is that correct? Right? Administering systems. So that's not going to quite work. Um, so we're, uh, well, anytime we're going to teach something, we're going to teach something at the tertiary level, what we really want to do is we want to think about what are the big, lasting, durable principles, the things that are going to work year after year after year. I mean, I graduated from university some number of years ago. And um, but the things that I was taught back then, even though I don't do those things in exactly the same way today, I mean the tools and practices have changed, but the big ideas have held up. They work for me. And so in system administration, this fairly new topic to teach, one of the challenges is to say, well, what are those core principles? What are the things that are going to hold up, even as the tools and techniques change? And another way to state that is that um, really what you want to learn, you want to learn why you're doing a thing, because if you understand why you're carrying out a task, then you're in a position, you're equipped to develop the kind of judgment that you need to decide for yourself how to do it. And that, that is education. That is something worth paying for, going to school for. So that's the kind of thing we want to do. So I guess that's the statement, that's the outline of the problem that I saw as I'm trying to, to design this new class in systems administration. I need to solve these kind of problems. But how specifically am I going to do it? Well. Whenever I'm confronted with a big sort of professional challenge, what do I do? I reach out to my network, I talk to peers whose opinions and views I respect and value, and I kind of say, what kind of ideas do you have? And presumably, um, you do the same kind of thing, because that's why you come to conferences like this one. So that's what I did. So in particular, I went out and I talked to working systems administrators that I knew, and I posed them the following question. I said, let's suppose that you're hiring an entry-level systems administrator, so your desk is piled high with these fresh freshly printed CVs of, of recent graduates. And what are the things I can do in this class that when you see it on, on my students' CVs, it's going to catch your eye and, and cause their CVs to rise as if by magic to the top of the stack? Because if I can do that, I mean, that's some measure of success. That's a, a good idea of what to do. And there was a pretty clear and rapid consensus amongst the, the people who I talked about. One of the things that's important to point out is they said, we need 
classes like that to be taught. We, when we look at recent graduates, they're not really being taught the sort of things that we need. So that's great. I mean, what I've learned early on is that the project seems to be worthwhile in the, in the eyes of the people who I, I, whose opinions I'm seeking. Another thing they pointed out right away, which they said, look, it's no big thing to configure, you know, Apache on one server. Great, you can do that. That's not. Um, but we really want to do the kind of alliance we're running, which are services that, you know, have multiple tiers. They're running across multiple services. As one person said, they have a lot of moving parts, often flying in different directions. And visualizing and understanding that, that's the kind of thing we want to see. Okay, so in my eyes, this is pretty good news. I think um, uh, Bob Young, right, the keynote, um, he would say, oh, you know, this is a problem that, that aligns with my business model, I guess is the entrepreneurial way to say it. Or I would say that it aligns with the way that I want to teach. Uh, this task works. Um, so what are the, the principles that I want that, that, that this is aligning with? One of them is that I don't so much like talking about things. I like, well... Okay, actually, I like talking about things. I mean, I'm doing that right now. That's not quite right. I, but I would rather that my students do things rather than talk about things or even worse, listen to me talk about those things. That's, that's the thing I want to have happen. And that's great because right away, we, the, what, what the, my colleagues who I talked to did was they said, okay, here's something to do, something worthwhile. I want a consistent thread through the whole class. Or to put it another way, what I don't want is, hey, we're gonna, this week we're going to do this topic, and we're going to complete it, and then we're going to set it aside and look at another topic. I want a theme where it says we're going to, throughout the course of the semester, we're working towards one big goal. Um, and the work that we're doing early in the semester is leading towards that big goal, and uh, the skills that we're developing early in the semester are skills that we're going to apply later in the semester. That's the kind of thing I want to get. And I guess what I'm looking for is some degree of what I call realism. And the quote marks there are very intentional. Because when I talk about realism, it's sort of a Disney-esque theme park sort of realism. Uh, uh, you know, not real as in the sense of push you off the pier and see if you can swim, but real in the sense of that I'm going to present you with scenarios that are carefully constructed so that you'll have the sort of experiences that I think will help you learn. And that's what I'm going at. And in particular, with our realism, we're going to accomplish that by giving you real tasks, the kind of tasks that system administrators are going to do, performed with real tools, the same tools that you'd use in the industry. And I highlight this one because that's really what I talk about, which is the assessment. I want to assess your work on some sort of realistic standard. If, I, you're, if I'm going to assess you on passing this exam, then you're going to direct your behavior towards passing the exam. You're going to learn how to pass the exam, because I've told you that's what impo what's important. So instead, I want to say, well, I'm going to measure your performance based on the same sort of things that, that your performance might be measured on in a workplace. Um, because then you're going to direct your behavior towards that sort of thing, and you're going to develop some sort of realistic skills. So that's the thing that we're going to try to accomplish. Okay, let's get concrete. I've got 16 weeks in my semester. I need to do something. Um, so in particular, I, I need to start. Remember I said I want to identify four, well, I didn't say four. It turned out to be four, sorry. I want to identify some, some fundamental, some big themes, some, some topics that I think are going to hold up, independent of how we execute those things. And so I, I hit on these four things. Um, and I'll point out here that when we look at these things, I, I in parentheses, talk about the software that we're going to use um, in demonstrating those ideas, not because the software is important in particular. It's not that you need to learn how to use Puppet, Chef's fine, whatever you want to use is fine, but because if you, for most of us here in the audience, if you know what pieces of software we're using, you have a good idea what kind of tasks we're talking about doing. That's one of the reasons why I'm telling you about the software. Another reason is because these are pieces of software that have worked pretty well for me, so maybe they'll work for you if you're trying to do a similar thing. So my first big theme is something I call the sysadmin professional practice, which really comes down to things like knowing how to work with a ticketing system, something that a typical graduate has never seen before. Um, and how to use that to organize and document work, and how to, to uh, and they need to learn how to write and maintain documentation. We'll see they don't always do that well at it, but neither do the rest of us. And in our case, we use MediaWiki for that. It's a good tool for system bins. And then we get on these three um, kind of what I call more technical topics that I decided were important. Um, these are configuration management, I'm using Puppet for that. System monitoring, we're using Nagios for that, and backup and cover with Bacula. Um, now, in particular, any 
proper old school sysadmin is going to look at this list of these three topics as I've constructed it and say, ah, oh, my, my great gray beard, you've got this wrong. I mean, backup and recovery is the important thing. That should be first. Um, and you're right. And in fact, the very first time I taught this class, I did backup and recovery first and did configuration management last. I mean, I don't do that anymore. And there are two reasons for that. The first is, if I teach you configuration management last, then I teach you configuration management after you've already done the lion's share of your configuration. And so that doesn't work out so well. It doesn't give you much opportunity to apply the skill. And so that's one reason why that goes first. Another thing is that in general, just observing student performance, the students seem to have the, the easiest time of those three topics with config management. So let's we'll start with that. Um, and then monitoring was the next thing, difficulty-wise for them, and back and recovery turned out to be the thing that they had the most difficult time with. Um, so that's fine, we'll present the topics in that way. And now we see what the quotes are around realism. The quotes are the shorthand for my certain sort of artistic license for how I can tweak realism in a way that leads to a, a good class. That's what I'm going to do. Um, and in particular, what we're going to do this is we're going to put the students in pairs. Right at the beginning of the semester, say, here, these are your, your virtual servers. Um, and we'll start early in the semester by getting these things up and running um, and then putting them to work later on in the semester. Okay. But remember, from one of my earlier slides, what I said, I said real tasks. So if you set up Puppet so that you can install and configure Nagios and then use that to monitor Puppet, that's starting to get a little bit contrived. That's not what we're after. And remember, this problem's already solved because early on people said, no, 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 I mean, run, find some interesting application to run, something that's got a few bits and pieces that, that, that's interesting enough and, and, and where the functionality is distributed across different services and different servers and that sort of thing. Um, and now we're getting close to this real assessment that I'm after. So the service that I found works pretty well is own cloud. It's got just a, the right degree of complexity, the right number of parts and that sort of thing. Um, and, and seems to work out pretty well as a service to have the students run. So we'll have uh, an application server that, and it's running the, the own cloud web and we'll have it talk to a MySQL database. And while we're at it, we'll have it um, off its users against an Active Directory. Because um, even though I said this is a Linux system administration class, um, it's good to look at this in the context of a, a heterogeneous environment. And, and again, the feedback that I get from sysadmins is, you know, you need some Active Directory in there because, you know, real world, that's something that, that, that's valuable. So, okay, we've got that. So they're going to deploy and operate this service. Um, and now they've got something to use Puppet, to use Nagios, to use Bacula for, um, to use RT and all that sort of thing, to, to um, successfully operate the service. So what in particular are we going to do? So as we get later in the semester, in the first parts of the semester, we're just getting all the infrastructure in place. Um, and then finally we say, okay, we've got this two-week period coming up, and this is your big assignment. This is your final project. Um, so, at the beginning of this two-week period, in fact, first thing Monday morning, you need to have OwnCloud up and running and ready to go. And over those next two weeks, um, you need to keep it running. You need to, in fact, a half of your mark is just going to come from uptime. Um, in particular, what I had hit on, as I said, over those two weeks, you can have two hours of downtime and it won't hurt your mark. And more than two, and, it's, and I start to take marks off. Which uh, seems kind of generous, but I remember these are students who are doing this for the first time. Um, and actually the arithmetic worked out in a convenient way. Um, and it seemed to work okay, but we'll see more on that later. Um, and there certainly are ways that you can fail to, uh, to hit that, that desired uptown mark. Yes? These things are all time the audio settings. All right. Sorry. I guess so. Uh, I don't know any jokes that don't violate the code of conduct. Is this the first system class they take? No, they do take a, like an elementary Linux class. How is that? How is that? It's quiet. Be quiet. Talk, say something. Uh, how does the sound level work for you guys? I can hear everything great, but... <laughs> Let's see, where was I getting? Oh, so how are you going to miss your uptown mark? Well, one is you're, you're going to miss your go-live date. You're not going to successfully get OwnCloud ready to go by the first thing Monday morning. And one reason you might not do that is because, you, for example, you haven't got your puppet sorted in such a way that you can efficiently get things deployed in that sort of way. So that can happen. The other thing is that 
be some problems over those two weeks. Part of what I'm paid for is to make sure those problems occur. Um, <laughs> And so these problems are going to lead to downtime and you're going to need to resolve those things quickly. And again, here's the thing that's important, is that I'm, we're not, I'm not presenting these problems to torment students. Not that I don't enjoy that part. <laughs> but because that's the way that I measure, like are they successfully using Nagios and that sort of thing. So let's take a look at that. But actually too, so that was half their mark. The other half, right, which is um, they're going to be presented with issues like tickets. I'll sort of role play the role of a typical user. I'll might role play the IT manager and I'll say, hey, you need to get this thing done. Um, and so besides measuring uptime and doing their mark on that, we're going to look at their performance on closing tickets. Are they closing them, you know, in a timely manner? Are they meeting a certain sort of rudimentary SLA that we've spelled out at the beginning of the assignment? Um, and are they effectively solving the problems and are they documenting their work properly and are they communicating with the affected parties so when they say, well, you're, I'm not closing this ticket as quickly as you would like, but at least I'll talk to you about why. Because um, that's, that's worthwhile. So that's the, the other half of that mark. Um, Tickets-wise, what are we talking about? And how does that, does that fit into my grand scheme of things? Well, you know, a trivially, you know, an ordinary user could ask for a password reset or something like that. Not all that interesting, but realistic, and, and make sure that they've got the process sorted out right. Now, restoring a deleted file is perfect because if they've got their backup and recovery operating properly, if they have documented the recovery procedure correctly, then they will very quickly restore that deleted file and their performance on that ticket, I mean, will be clear that, it, that it's excellent. So they will have demonstrated that they can apply, they have applied the principles of backup and recovery correctly. That's the kind of thing I'm after. Um, in my little IT manager role playing thing, one of the things I like to do is just give them a big list and say, oh, I've got these 500 new users coming online and I want them up, you know, start a business tomorrow morning. Um, <laughs> And what I hope the students are going to do is they're going to knock up a little a nice script and get that thing sorted out. They don't have to. I'm not going to mark their performance on, I'm not going to look at the script. I'm going to see did they get the 500 users online in, a, you know, in the deadline that I gave. And either way I win. Because either they wrote a script and successfully completed the task, or they didn't write a script, in which case they learned the hard way, which is the best way to learn anything, that next time they're going to write a script. <laughs> okay. Um, so that works out pretty well. And another important thing, so remember when I was talking about programming and I said, look, you know, when you, when you do a programming exercise, you produce an artifact that I can look at later. Tickets or an artifact that I can look at later. Any good ticketing system, I can go back later on and look through the log of the tickets. And now I'm like, aha, I've got something I can look at that tells me about how you did. It says, oh, how long did it take you? I mean, again, did you carry out the, the process, the procedure in an effective and a reasonable manner? Um, so that's working well for me there. OK. Um, <laughs> Okay. Um, so yeah. Now this is get the fun part, which is I just get to go, you know, vandalize things. That yeah, works out pretty well. Um, yeah, yeah. So of course there's an easy way around that, which is I don't log in as my normal user. But oh well. The um, still, it was worth it was worth putting making a note. So yeah, I'm just going to go in and break stuff. So yeah, I, mean, I could just go in and quietly shut down my SQLD, no big deal. But again, this is perfect, because if they've got Nagios running right and doing, the, doing what it's supposed to do, they're going to get alerted in a way which both shows that something is wrong and in fact zeroes in on what's wrong. So if Nagios is doing its job for them, and if they've done their job in getting Nagios set up, then I can shut down my SQLD. They're going to have that sorted in just a few minutes. About as fat quickly as they can get the alert, they can solve the problem. And if they don't have Nagios sorted very well, well, not everybody gets the A, I guess that's why. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm not always going to be that gentle. It's just not in my nature. So at some point, I, I want to do something nasty. Um, and I do warn students. I say, sometime in the two weeks, I'm, you know, I will do something unpleasant. And so um, in the 2014 instance of this, this paper, what did I do? Pretty much I just... Um, you know, went under their systems, 
picked some strategic directories and did, you know, RM minus RF, um, wiped out some stuff, defaced their website, generally mucked things up really well. Um, in a way that, that they wouldn't be easy to recover if they're not doing their job right. And, yeah, I did it around 3 a.m., what the heck? Yes? I'm assuming you screwed that. Did I what? Did you, you Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, I did, although there's a, um, more on that later, I guess, because yeah, I would like to do a better job of that. Um, okay, so great. So now they've got real downtime. And now that, you know, are they going to hit that, that two-hour window? Now this is a real challenging thing. And all of the components that we talked earlier are going to come into play. Have they documented their procedures correctly so they can quickly resolve this issue? You know, are, are, is Puppet sorted out right so that it can restore config? Are there backups and recovery ready to go? Um, if so, then they're not going to have trouble. They're going to recover from even a mess like that in the, the window that we have. And, and many of them do. Um, now, how am I going to observe all this? Because I remember I said there were two parts of the problem. One is, what are the students going to do? And the other is, how am I going to observe it? Because really, I need to observe it as it's happening, but I can't do that. I can't observe it over a two-week period around the clock. Um, even I don't drink that much coffee. Um, so I'm mean, going of course, have my own instance of Nagios. I mean, you know, eating my own dog food, I guess. Um, so uh, the, tracking the uptime, that part's easy. Um, we get that. And again, I, I said earlier, look, these RT ticket logs themselves are, are a terrific artifact. The wiki, one of the great things about a wiki, a wiki is a good documentation tool. It's a good teaching tool because I can go look at the edit history and see there and say, ah, oh, look, there are a whole lot of edits, like right before the deadline. Um, so yeah, again, these tools are working for me. They're helping me see, you know, uh, to assess observe and assess performance in a, in a pretty good way. And then what, I, what I'm going to do with each student group is after that, I sit down and have this uh, post-mortem session where we're going to look through the, the RT logs together and talk, well, let's see how that thing went and, you know, and, and figure out what the mark is. So, all right, I'm pretty happy with this. This thing's working okay. Um, so in particular, how did it go? So remember, the big first measure was uptime. Um, and I say it went surprisingly well. So if we look at that, that 2014 instance, so I went in and, and trashed um, a server pretty hard, made it pretty useless. Um, and nearly every student, every student group who could get a passing mark um, was, had no trouble getting their system back up and running inside that two hour window. In fact, they didn't have quite enough trouble. If I look and say this is something I need to improve on, I need to make it a bit harder. Um, which I guess as an instructor that's a good thing to have. Or maybe I'm just really good. But I think I need to make it a little bit harder. I actually had one student team who, after trashing their server, had everything restored and functioning in approximately 10 minutes, which is pretty remarkable. Now in the Porsche motor, motor to me, it did come out that a large part of that was good luck. That well, one of the students was at that very moment acting something. And so immediately there was a problem and immediately started restoring from backup and that worked out great and, and good on them, I mean that's fine. Um, but yeah, really as it turned out, if you, um, you know, any team that was capable of getting a passing mark actually resolved this, which should have been a difficult issue in about an hour and I said they had about two. So this is an area where things need to work, so what could I do? Um, well one is again, maybe yeah, I'm satisfied and that's okay. Uh, another is maybe two hours is just too much downtime to allow. Maybe I should shorten the window. But I did say that the arithmetic worked out really nice. The two hours worked out to be a nice percentage. So I don't quite want to do that. And in fact, my suspicion, my, my hunch, and the way I'm going to approach this is the third way, which is that um, I need to mess with their systems a little bit more, a little bit more often. And in a slightly more unpredictable way, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. As far as resolving sort of issues, like tickets, um, student performance on tickets, as far as like closing tickets, they did pretty well. Now, in a lot of ways, that makes sense. I mean, one of the very, the very first thing we started at the beginning of the semester was using ticketing. And in fact, throughout the semester, whenever the students had to perform a task, whenever I assigned something, I assigned it by opening a ticket. So by, the, by this time late in the semester, they've got, for the most part, they've got this ticketing process down, and they're resolving issues promptly. But one of the things that they're not taking on board, or at least they're not demonstrating to me that they've taken on board, is that, that I'm trying to say, look, the ticketing system is both a way to organize your tasks and prioritize what you need to do, but it's also a documentation tool. It's a 
build up a little knowledge base of how to solve these problems. So when a ticket comes up and you say, well, that's really similar to what I've seen in the past, I should be able to go back and look in the ticket logs and see how to do it. Um, some, but, but I don't think enough student groups were really taking advantage of that feature. So that's something to sort out. And documentation otherwise, nah, no, no, that, that didn't work out very well. Let's be honest, how many of us are really good documenters? Yeah, well, but I mean, it needs to be better. Um, and how can I make it better? Well, let's take a look at the Nagios. So I was actually pretty happy in student groups um, did well with Nagios. When I talked to them after the semester, student groups had a good impression. They really got Nagios. They understood the value of Nagios. That's something I was really happy with. Why don't they understand the value of documentation? Well, one is they hate writing documents. I understand that. Um, but another is, with the Nagios example, there was this clear and broad path between get Nagios working right, perform well on the assessment. Everybody got that. And what seems to be missing is in that documentation thing is that that path is neither clear nor broad that good documentation is leading to good performance. So that's something I, I need to work on and quite frankly I'm not really sure how. I mean I'm not sure how I'm going to form that broad clear path but but I wish I did. We'll suggest one. You will suggest one? All right. You have to repeat the question for microphone purposes. Get teams to split up and mix halfway through the process. Ah, uh, yeah. Repeat the question. Right. So, so Jim here suggested that um, having students, you know, hand off and use somebody else's documentation on their servers would be a way to work. Yeah, that is a good way. Uh, I have a suggestion as well, actually. Yes. Uh, yeah, microphones. You can have a final exam as well that is worth some number of marks where within a time limit they have to follow their documentation to rebuild the exact same or a very similar server configuration. Yeah, um, yeah, I see what you're saying. Um, yeah. Another might be to uh, have as part of your documentation stuff that they need to document for users which you can then say you, know, you log an uh, RT ticket to say hey I don't know how to create mm -hmm. my own blah and the documentation for that once the, a user has asked that you put it on the wiki yeah. there's your documentation there's a clear path if yeah. you don't see that then you log another ticket hmm. oh, I like that yeah Um, my suggestion is to uh, emphasize the use of playbooks and so mm. to actually have that in the wiki um, and particularly break a system in the same way twice so then you can see how well people actually filled out their playbook the first time right. and how well they actually used it the second time. Yeah, very much so. And certainly we talk about playbooks, but again, what I, yeah. I, I'm just saying that's not a message that my students are taking on board. Yeah, so, so certainly yeah. if you, you know, yeah, you're, you're saying that they use RT to document how they fixed it, if you actually, you know, kind of emphasize you should have a playbook for this, write your playbook and then reference in RT how yep. you used it, then yep. you might find that a lot better. Yeah, a very good idea. And again, it's certainly something I talk about. I just, I don't think I'm being heard uh, yet. Anything else? These are some good ideas, though. I like that. This is... I win. You have an idea? All right. What I've made my students do is for each, each thing we do, go around the room and it's your turn, it's your turn, it's your turn. You're the guy writing the documentation for this step this time. Mm -hmm. and, and then social pressure occurs. And if you do a bad job and you have to hand it out to all the other students and all the other students will see the bad job you did yeah. and then just stand back and let social pressure occur. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. The tough thing, I don't know how your students are, but mine, social pressure often works against my goals, not toward them. <laughs> but oh well. Okay. But so, yeah, there's a problem. I do appreciate... Oh, yes. Another one. Just one, one small addition to the suggestion before about having a final exam. What you could do is do it in a lab condition where they do not have the internet and only have their own wikis. Yeah. And they have to go from there. I like that one too. What I mean. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. But then you could also maybe lock off the uh, internal documentation for the different products as well. So you can't yep. get the Nagios README or anything else. So they're literally on their own. Mm, yeah, but that's just me being a little bit sadistic. 
I was going to say I hope somebody's writing these down, but if somebody's recording them, so even better. Okay. Yeah. No, this is, I mean, this is all great, and this is exactly why I'm here. Yeah, I do love to talk, but I really actually like to get good ideas, and I'm getting them, so thank you very much for that, and hopefully we'll get some more of that going on. A couple other notes, some interesting things that I observed about student performance. So um, we asked like, somebody when we were having mic issues, somebody said, well, is this their first systems administration course? They, they are required to take a more elementary Linux course um, earlier on in the curriculum, so it isn't their first time. But in general, my observation is the typical student is not entering this class with the level of Linux proficiency that I would like to see. Now, I think there are two possible sort of explanation, or two possible solutions there. And one of them is to say, well, we need to integrate more Linux earlier in the curriculum so they're more familiar with using it um, before they get into this class where they're using it under a considerable amount of pressure. And that sounds like a lovely and well reasoned thing, and I'm, I'm actually skeptical that it will work. Um, and in fact, I mean, I do think that we should integrate more links into the curriculum and those sort of things, but there are a lot of issues around that. And, and quite frankly, the reason I don't think it will work is that I think a, another solution is that maybe I actually need to lower my standards. And I don't really mean that in a pessimistic way. I mean, one, one of the things that we often lose sight of, so... I don't know, I've been doing this stuff for a long time, and you have to stay in touch with, I mean, the way that educators like to state this is you have to meet your students where they are. And maybe where they're going to be is they're not going to be at that level of Linux proficiency. For what it's worth, their Windows proficiency isn't anything to write home about either. So, um, <laughs> you know, it's not just a Linux thing. Um, and, and no, I mean, really, maybe the thing is to say, look, at this stage in your education, you're not going to be that proficient, and I need to incorporate it in my plans. And probably the solution is a balance of those two things. I need to have realistic standards, and I need to work to make sure that those realistic standards are being reinforced throughout the curriculum. I think that's probably true. Um, another bit there. So, interesting thing that happened in, I've, I've run this class twice, 2013, 2014. The 2014 group set up a Facebook group to share some information. It was, a, they didn't tell me they set up a Facebook group. They didn't invite me to look at it. And if they had, I would not have done so. Um, in sort of a, what is that, a Heisenberg-esque sort of way, I would have been concerned that by observing the thing, I would have changed it. And I didn't want to do that. Um, and in part, the goal's great. Um, that is, they're collaborating and they're sharing information. And the thing that I'm telling my students all the time is you need to collaborate and share information. So great, they're, they, they're doing that, and that's fine. The trick there was that some of the collaborating and sharing information might be, ah, looks like Tom just killed my MySQLD. You might want to go look at your server and see if he's done the same thing. So uh, in the way that I was introducing problems, I think that I have been too predictable. I'm easily, you know, the, the easily defeated by this Facebook sort of approach. Facebook. Whatever happened to IRC? <laughs> but, whatever. Um, so that's fine. I mean, I, the solution there is not that I think the students should change, because I think they're doing the right thing. It's that I need to change and be more unpredictable, and so we'll talk about that a little bit. And finally, um, students seem to enjoy the class. Now, I mean, generally when I teach, the goal is for me to enjoy the class. Um, and I did too, but the students did enjoy it. And no, I mean, that's, that really is a useful measure. Um, and I'll tell you one reason why it's useful. And, and anybody else here who, who works in the education field, maybe tell me whether you see this too. In my degree program, I very much see that the first class destination for students, the good students, are supposed to train to be developers. And that system administration has traditionally been seen as the exit path for students who, for whatever reason, didn't see much future for themselves as a program. I mean, that, that really happens. Um, and I, th I, think that, that I think I've done some work to try to, to defeat that image, but I'm still not done with that one. But the fact that students are enjoying the class and they're telling other students that they are enjoying the class means that I'm introducing to the students the idea that systems administration is itself a first class career destination. And some of the students are taking that on board. So if I've had a particular success with this class I'm proud of, it is precisely that. Um, that's something that I'm happy about. Um, yeah, it also turns out that some of my students who are working said, yeah, they're taking what they learned in the class and putting it to work in the workplace, which actually tells me two things. One is you're working somewhere and they're not already doing these things. But, but I guess if they were, I'd be out of a job. So, okay. Um, and, and again, what it shows is that, that what the work that I'm doing seems to be relevant and that sort of thing. So I'm happy with that. 
risks. So what's, what do we need to do from here? Academic talk, you're supposed to end with a future work slide. It's the obligatory last slide or second last slide. So I've got two issues here. So one, I said I'm too predictable. So yeah, I've got scripts and things to, to produce the problem, but the problem is the way that I'm applying them means that I tend to give everybody the same problem scenario at approximately the same time. Um, what I really need to find is some sort of software tool that lets me automate it and, and schedule these kind of things in a more staggered, less predictable way. A configuration anti-manager, as I call it. Um, and I think that's right because I think the most likely thing is that I can take one of the system management tools that's already out there and adapt it or, or perhaps pervert it to, to meet my goals. Um, I think that's probably approach. Maybe I need some modification or maybe I need to write something myself, but I suspect not. And that is the very next thing on my to-do list. That is the thing I will do when I get home. Is, is that a five or is that a time? Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> Hi. Hmm? Should know how this works. There we go. <laughs> um, so some of the stuff you talked about, the, the class, a lot, there's a, there is a very real need uh, for for some of the stuff you're talking about mm -hmm. in information security and infosec. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you know, so this is, could basically be a training, like an introductory course for infosec. And I would mm -hmm. maybe suggest that take some of your more uh, advanced students and take them onto like an infosec 101 and set them loose on your juniors. Ah. <laughs> I know I don't have a microphone and that's fine. I've done exactly that, they're too evil. <laughs> Dude, you cannot let juniors attack freshmen, it goes bad. Your adversary is evil. Yeah. Information security is, we wanted them to leave. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, no, I mean, I, I see exactly what you're saying, and I think there's something there, and again, that's definitely something I've taken on board. The real is, remember the Disney theme park bit, which is that I want it to be predictable in a way. Predictable, like, I, I want to know they're going to be presented with the right scenarios. I like that approach. I just need to think about how that fits into this big picture. But, um, but that is the very next challenge I want to work with. And then finally, what I, I, mean, what I have adopted as a matter of course is, uh, is that all my, my teaching materials, as I produce them, they go on GitHub. Um, both so that I can share them with colleagues and that sort of thing, and so that I can foster some open collaboration, because that's what we're about, and that sort of thing. For that matter, that's how my students get their course notes. I'm like, you want the course notes? You, you pull down the repo. Um, and so that's something going on. Be aware that I follow the open source. I commit early and often, and I don't worry that there are bugs. Um, they will get fixed over time. Um, if you spot an error in my course notes, I like pull requests. <laughs> Um, so that's what I do. And the last bit of future work is this idea of, yeah, I want to foster that sense of open collaboration. I want to seek out and build a, 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 and help build a community of practitioners who are working on the same sorts of things I have. What I said are these are some of my ideas around core. I'd like to hear other ideas, or maybe I'd like to hear people say that my ideas are great. Either way, I'd like to, to be a community. And in part, that's what I'm doing here. That's what we're all doing here. Um, and so that's the, the last bit of future work that I'm working on. Okay. Great. There's my lovely questions or feedback. Is there? Is there time for that question? Yeah, we have time for Excellent. a few questions. Okay. Cool. Um, one observation. One question. Mm -hmm. The observation is that we, I think, are incredibly fortunate to have an entire stack. Where of all of those things that not only can do the students get to use for free in their lab environment and whatever in the university, but they can take home, they can use on their own systems, they can use elsewhere, they can use in, in business. Yes. Uh, and that is something that I think is an amazing competitive advantage for open source software um, that universities need to keep pushing because mm -hmm. it's all very well for you know, proprietary companies to come in and say we'll give you this license for free but usually it comes with a bunch of conditions about where those students can't take it. Yes. The question I have is did you find any of your students saying that what you were doing by being able to log in as root and do whatever you like was unfair? Um. No, and I think that's a really good question because if they had said so I, I could see that point. But no, um, 
I got really good feedback that students appreciated being confronted with these challenges, even if the f I made it easy for myself by making sure I had root on their servers. Um, no, I, uh, the, the response from students is very positive. I'm happy with hmm? Apologies if you already covered this. Are your students um, undergrad or postgrad? These are undergrads, so they're in the third year of their undergrad program. And do you, do you require a programming type of introduction in addition to the Linux introduction before it? There's a, a programming introduction built into the degree program, so I don't need to do anything extra. You know, all students in, in our degree have taken at least a full year of programming. I'm just curious how much hand-holding you were providing them with things like the Nagio setup and um, if you gave them the two-hour window, did you sort of suggest that they had to have an on-call roster or anything like that or? Yeah, I explicitly said you need to have a, an on-call schedule. You need to account for 24 hours a day over that two-week period. So yes, very much so. Hand-holding? Um, yeah, I mean, the earlier parts of the semester was they're setting on Nagios, but yeah, I mean, I, I was very much there as a resource to help them see how to do it. And uh, a paper like this in the third year, a lot of it is you take a stab at it and when you start to have trouble, um, then, I, then I'm ready to help you. But I usually like students to try it on their own first and seek help when they decide they need it. So I'm just curious, how much, uh, I don't know if you actually looked at like, things like bash history to see what methodology they've applied, because obviously commenting on tickets to keep track of their own workflow yeah. wasn't working as well. How many, did, you, did you see many people actually applying problem solving methodology as opposed to just resorting to a backup restore? Um, well, a couple things. One is I didn't systematically look at bash history. Now and then I did, just as, a, as an actual effective marketing thing that doesn't, well, it doesn't scale. So that's a problem with it. Um, frankly, problem solving versus restoring from backup, I mean, both are valid approaches, so I'm not sure. But um, yeah, they're basically, there's, there's only so much I can do. And that kind of really detailed looking at it, um, I don't think I can do that. I don't think time-wise that works. Even though, yeah, if I could think, if we could come up with a way to automate it, we could do that. Uh, uh, slightly non-technical, but have you got, have you started um, edging into looking at the mental health issues associated with the industry? Mental health issues? Yeah, it is. Um, no, well, I do early on. So remember, one of the big themes was this idea of professional practice. And one of the things I'm making clear, one, one of the ways I phrase it is that they need to carve out a space for them to say no, to push back and say, you need to accomplish a reasonable kind of balance in your work. So that is something that we talk about in this semester. Yeah, and I think it is important. Okay, so we have time for one more question. And, sorry? Okay. Okay. Um, is yours very long? We might be able to fit it in. Okay. Mine's great. The way, the way I automate the breaking of student stuff mm -hmm. and the way I add unpredictability is I make a list of 10 things that could break on your server. Mm -hmm. I cut them into little pieces of paper. I sort of randomly throw them at students. And I tell each student, you go find somebody who you hate and break their computer in this way. Hmm. <laughs> and, and it's random in the sense I'm just throwing them randomly at them. Mm -hmm. And it's automated in the sense that I don't have to do it, they get to do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, there's a point there. All right, we need to wrap up, but I do want to add one last thing in terms of that future work. So I, I just want to make a little plea at the end. If you are here and in some way represent, or if you're part of a group that employs, say, recent graduates who have studied system administration, I really want to talk to you because I, I work with a lot of bright, um, you know, highly engaged young people, and I would love to see them work, and I'd love to see them get work at the kind of clueful organizations that send their people to something like LCA. So maybe we can make that one happen. All right, thanks. Okay.